Niña, yo recuerdo la pena y el dolor Y este sentimiento de duda y de rencor Bella, ya tú sabes, me quiero redimir Tú tienes la llave que calma mi sufrir Y tú te vas, tú te vas Award for his fiction, 
and also winner of the Anne Seegers Award for Fiction in Germany. But I think the prize that he probably chose us the most was being given the Miguel Angel Asturias National Award for Lifetime Achievement in Guatemalan Literature in 2008. And um, I'll place him alongside Augusto Monterroso. And so he's very, very uh, august company to uh, come on that title. Um, and the other great things I want to say is that um, one thing about uh, his relationship with the, the production of El Norte was that he gave him a chance to tour the United States International Film Festival with the producers of that movie, which gave him a chance then to describe the conditions in Guatemala and denounce the atrocities of the authoritarian government. And he, whenever he speaks publicly, certainly up in the public sometimes, he, he reminds us that Guatemala is still in many ways in, in a situation of intense civil conflict, especially as it, it pertains to indigenous people. Um, I'll finish on this little personal note. Professor Arias and I have some unexpected things in common, I found out. Uh, uh, well, I know for a start the common interest is Central American literature, because that's where I mostly work. But we both like James Lewis and Roland Barthes. Um, and we both attend a new experiment in intellectual culture, which is Central American cultural studies, generated from Central America by Central America. And this is now just in its infancy, and it's going to be interesting to see where it goes. Also, when I was an undergraduate studying Latin American studies in Melbourne many years ago, I wrote my first history essay on Jacobo Arbenz um, and the United Fruit Company. And he was then Guatemalan president. And for those of you who know the US engineer coup through Colonel uh, Castillo Armas, and that then precipitated gradually throughout this day a long internal struggle for Guatemalans to throw off that yoke of that conservative uh, oligarchic class that runs that company. So I found it interesting when I, I found out through reading some things about Professor Harris' private life that that essay I wrote about uh, Hakko Wagens and the United Fruit Company's implication in the coup, it was a very swift coup. And they flew some planes over Guatemala City and dropped some bombs and that. A young child was hiding with his family, taking shelter, and uh, during that, and that was Professor Arias. So um, uh, it would be important to draw any more uh, uh, a limb scope than that. Um, so it's with great pleasure that I welcome a Central Americanist, and um, most of you know that we can count the Central Americans in Australia on Django Reinhardt's left hand. Um, so maybe this will be a stimulation for more of you to take a, a deeper interest in Central America. So thank you, and I welcome Professor Arias. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you, and I want to thank Jeff for such a warm introduction. Um, since he brought up the issue of the Academy Award, uh, I'll, I might as well add that the fun thing about the nomination was the nomination itself, but not for the reasons you might think. Until that year, uh, a film produced in the U.S. had to be uh, spoken at least 60% in English to count as a U.S. production. And then no, there wasn't, because it was primarily in Spanish and Quiche. And so, I don't know the percentage by heart, maybe 25% English. So, it could not be nominated. And so, the nomination was used to break the Academy rules and to enable productions, not just from the U.S., but from any country, to be spoken in whatever language, regardless of the country behind the production. So that was the real fun about that particular nomination. Um, let me thank also John Mintz for inviting us here. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to be able to come. It's our, I say our, because I'm here with my wife, Jill Robbins. Um, our first time in Australia. Um, we already took Sydney, loved it. Uh, we're heading to Melbourne after here. So it's been definitely a great pleasure to, to have the opportunity 
<coughs> to join you here. My talk is titled Descent in Latin American Studies. And it is not exclusively mine in the sense that three of us who are past presidents of LASA, uh, professors Charlie Hale uh, of anthropology in my own institution, University of Texas at Austin, and Sonia Alvarez, political scientist at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, we decided that given the shift that Jeff mentioned in LASA, we would come together and produce an edited volume of all the issues that signal those changes taking place within us. Uh, the, the manuscript has just been completed, uh, depending on our luck with Duke University Press, we may see it out there in a couple of years. Duke is slow. Uh, but uh, as a result, what I'm going to be talking to you today, it's a brief summary of the introduction, and though uh, needless to say, many of the ideas expressed are mine, some of them are also Sonia's and Charlie's because uh, we basically had a couple of big uh, brainstorming sessions in which we spent literally days just talking about the issues, ordering them, sorry, I'm a little close to the mic. Uh, and so it reflects the thinking of us three, and not exclusively of me alone, um, and a shared view of what Latin American studies is and where it's going. From the perspective of the Americas, I emphasize this since we conceive that as people who are located in the US, by participating within Latin American studies, of course, from various positionalities, my own case, as Jeff mentioned, as a Central American. In the early 1990s, an influential group of scholars, foundation representatives, and observers of academic trends from the United States came to the conclusion that area studies were in crisis. All of the critiques and calls for reformulation applied to a heterogeneous array of area studies fields, they had particular resonance within Latin American studies. Rooted in disciplinary and institutional developments dating back to the beginning of the 20th century, Latin American studies came into its own in the 1950s in the context of the Cold War. It rapidly, rapidly became the largest, most well-funded, and most prestigious of the area studies fields in the United States. For this reason, among others, Latin American studies assume the central role in the broader debate. Should area studies persist in their current form? If not, what successor intellectual and institutional configurations should emerge in their place? The critiques of area studies that emerged in the 1990s were influential because they focused attention on existing methodological problems often embodying constructive proposals for much needed change. What they did not take into account was the extent to which creative solutions to these underlying problems were being generated from within the field itself, albeit often from the margins. Even as it was institutionalized in US universities and research centers during the post-war decades, Latin American studies was always a space of ferment and contestation. Most notably among its scholars, there has always been strong dissent from prevailing US government policies toward the region, especially in, in relation to Cuba in the 1960s and 70s, and Central America in the 1980s. The same goes for theoretical innovation from within. Efforts were underway within the Latin American Studies Association, LASA, to engage feminist theories and gender politics at least since the mid-1970s with the creation of the Task Force for Women in Latin American Studies, the forerunner of today's gender and feminist studies section. Similarly, by the mid-1990s, when the crisis was no more than a few years old, efforts were undertaken to bring cultural studies and related interdisciplinary perspectives more centrally into the flow of intellectual exchange and to confront the conceptual and political problems associated with the sharp division 
between Latino, Latina, and Latin American studies. By way of example, when Jean Franco became the first humanities professor to serve as LASA president in 1989, she directed a concerted effort to attract humanities to LASA since their participation was then negligent. In 1990, 95% of the membership all came from the social sciences. After a decade of initiatives by Franco and others, humanists made up 40% of the membership. Similar efforts were made during the 1990s to include other groups that had been traditionally excluded from LASA. Thus, the first queer studies panel took place at the 18th Congress in 1994 in Atlanta, although the first plenary session on U.S. Latino studies was not held until 2001 at the 23rd Congress in Washington, D.C. The, <clears throat> the gradually increasing numbers of Latin America-based intellectuals within LASA and of Latin American diasporic intellectuals who joined faculties in the North also contributed to these internal processes of revelation. Finally, the crisis, however real and witty it might have been in the North, was virtually irrelevant to Latin American-based intellectuals because Latin American studies was still a predominantly Northern scholarly field. As horizontal dialogue among differentially positioned intellectuals gradually began to displace the hierarchical model of Northern scholars studying the South, this inequity, another important factor in the crisis, could be more clearly identified and addressed. Critiques of Latin American studies were simultaneously substantive, political, and epistemological, although the emphasis of these three facts, uh, facets uh, varied. Challenges to U.S. policies toward Latin America through the 1980s, for example, were political, but otherwise remained largely within established disciplinary boundaries and often implicitly endorsed the national state center premises as a field. Subsequent critical interventions departed sharply from these premises, working to frame research topics and analysis from the perspective of peripheral and marginalized collective actors. In some cases, this brought largely new substantive areas into Latin American studies, for example, queer studies. In others, it produced a radical shift in conceptual lens, for example, the study of indigenous and Afro-descendant peoples, with a central focus on political agency and collective self-representation. The political and epistemological challenges to the field deepened as growing numbers of intellectuals from these marginalized groups acquired academic training, which contributed to a blurring of the traditional constituted line between political assertion and knowledge production. These challenges focused critical attention on the epistemological underpinnings of Latin American studies in at least three dimensions. The nation state center premises, which fix the boundaries of Latin America and the limited priority topics within each national space, the north south hierarchy, and the subject object dichotomy, which posited that objects of study did not produce knowledge in their own right. By the beginning of this century, Latin American studies was bristling with multiple lines of innovation, debate, and contestation that these challenges had generated. In this paper, I pursue three goals. First, I offer a detailed reflection on why Latin American studies needed to be decentered, noting both the problematic baggage that the field had taken on since its inception. Next, I explain what is meant by decentering Latin American studies, filling out an understanding of the five components of my vision. Finally, I briefly consider the concerns, problems, and contradictions associated with this vision. So why the center Latin American studies? Although every studies originated in the years following World War II, Latin American studies had their origins in U.S. expansion into the Caribbean basin in the wake of the Cuban-Spanish-American War. Tulane's Roger Thayer Stone Center for Latin American Studies the oldest in the country is emblematic of this history. The center was founded in 1924 when Tulane benefactor Samuel Seymour 
the founder of the QML Fruit Company, forerunner of the United Fruit Company of infamous trajectory in the entire Caribbean basin, made a large gift of a library, archaeological artifacts, and an endowment to establish the Department of Middle American Research. Fueled by similar imperial motives, the University of Florida Center for Latin American Studies was founded in 1931. The University of Texas at Austin Gosano Long Institute of Latin American Studies, the country's largest, was established in 1940. Area studies became the vogue in U.S. academia in the 1950s and 60s during the Cold War. Launched with a developmentalist mentality in which the notions of third world and underdevelopment emerged, emerged the term area studies itself is a general description of many heterogeneous fields of research within a geographical position, i.e. Latin America, Middle East, Asia, Africa, and so on, often involving the disciplines of history, political science, sociology, anthropology, and foreign languages in their origin. As Dr. Escobar has argued, the developmentalist mentality transformed the relationship between rich and poor countries and the world's understanding of what social transformations were expected from all national governments within the orbit of the West. Being region and place-specific allowed area studies not only deep place anchored analysis, but also a relational one, that is, examining linkages between places and social formations. Their development was partly a response to the increasing global influence of the United States but also to inadequacies in US-centric understandings of the world in the context of the Cold War. Despite area studies' multidisciplinary institutional configuration, most area specialists remained firmly grounded in a discipline that made universalistic knowledge claims and whose basic premises were, in most cases, Eurocentric. Federal funding encouraged this trend, which grew throughout the 1950s. In the United States, area studies were strengthened by the passing of Title VI of the National Defense Education Act of 1958, which provided resources for centers of area and international studies. Increased interest in Latin America grew dramatically after the Cuban Revolution and was partly responsible for the explosive growth of scholars wanting to specialize on Latin American issues in the 1960s. As part of this same growth, the Latin American Studies Association, LASA, was founded in 1966. In Great Britain, the 1965 Paris Report provided similar impetus for the establishment of institutes and centers of Latin American studies. The political complexity of the 1960s and the relative financial well-being of this period inspired many U.S. graduate students to visit Latin America. Exchange and study abroad programs flourished during this decade. It was the first time that a significant percentage of U.S. university students traveled south of the border to gain knowledge and develop research projects. This experience radicalized many students who, upon their return, threw their energies in support of popular struggles on the continent, before obtaining their graduate degrees and initiating academic careers in the 1970s. The fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 signaled the end of the post-World War II global order, particularly the end of the Cold War cultural, political, economic regime that had ushered in the notion of the three worlds, the ideology of developmentalism, and a certain style of U.S. hegemony in the hemisphere. These events helped trigger the so-called crisis of area studies. The intensification of globalization, changing paradigms emerging from new expressions of feminist, racial, and sexual politics, and the perceived lack of need for area-specific expertise in a world free of the threat of communism, together with area studies' lack of insertion within the established departmental structures of many universities, combined to transform them into a seemingly endangered species. The strategic and economic forces that have sustained area studies during the second half of the 20th century seem to vanish. These challenges to the core assumptions that had driven area studies during the Cold War were compounded by neoliberal educational reforms 
a process that reordered universities' priorities and their modes of funding, setting programs unable to maximize profits along the lines of business models, and pushing area studies to fund their activities through donation and external grants. These developments led to a series of questions of the object of study, from resignifying Latin American studies under conditions of globalization, to an apprehension that established social science theories and methods, as well as the traditional humanities approach to cultural production, had become insufficient to the task. Such interrogations were expressions of the transformations taking place in U.S. academic circles as many native Latin American scholars migrated to U.S. campuses and as interdisciplinary studies prompted many to question the theoretical premises underlying the study of distinct and stable areas with putatively congruent cultural, linguistic, or geographical identities. It was around this time that post-structuralism, as a language and meaning-based social theory, made its entry, impacting many theories and fields in both the humanities and social sciences. One of the consequences of this process was a number of concerted efforts to revisit the nature of what had come to be known as Latin American studies. These developments prompted many practitioners to deploy alternative means of scholarly knowledge production, as well as to transform the knowledge practices through which scholars came to understand their object of study. Ironically, whereas many Latin Americans have been on the cutting edge in the process of questioning area studies and challenging assumptions about their basic premises as lapsed, biased, or the heritage of outdated American policy in the developing world, the institutions in which they work continue to define departments and disciplines according to those problematic norms. Area studies are presently being affected once more by financial retrenchment as a consequence of the collapse of the global economy in 2008. Therefore, Latin American studies not only have to better respond to the present context, but they have to do so with fewer resources and with the threat of even scarcer ones in the future. Latin American studies must be decentered if it is to continue to thrive in this transformed environment. Demographic shifts, diasporas, labor migrations, the movements of global capital and media, and processes of cultural circulation and hybridization have brought into question the nature of areas, identities, and compositions. Globalization, space-time compression, and greater international mobility have created an intensification of overlaps and brought together intellectual travelers that were formerly kept largely separate. What has come into question in the wake of contemporary approaches about population and cultural movements across regions and nations is the notion that the world can be divided into knowable, self-contained areas of study. Indeed, Latin America is today a global reality. As Walter Mignon said at a 2001 retreat to formulate the last strategic plan, Latin America is now the perspective, not the area of study. By this, Mignolo meant that Latin America is no longer a geographical entity to be studied. Rather, it now signifies a reorientation of knowledge and an epistemology that looks at global concerns from a Latin American perspective, independently of who is doing the looking, from where, and what is being looked at. At the same time, there is greater complexity in the boundaries that define the area of study. Traditionally, Latin American studies embody and respect disciplinary boundaries. In most cases, Latin Americanists have been primarily organized by discipline. But disciplinary divisions no longer work as well as in the past. Increasingly, Latin Americanists find themselves both anchored in a disciplinary formation and, at the same time, crossing disciplinary boundaries. While there are still relatively few academic interdisciplinarians, many Latin Americans today deliberately adopt either transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary approaches in addressing issues they face. One can readily observe today an intensification of the expectation that intellectual activity be addressed in an interdisciplinary fashion, whether by individuals or by teams of individual, individuals with different skills working together. Major funding agencies are also requiring, requiring interdisciplinary approaches above single disciplinary ones in many areas of study. 
At present, we have also had articulations of local, regional, national, and even post-national identities. The 2008 conferences, Times of Change and Opportunities for the Afro-Colombian Population at Howard University, the African Diaspora in the Americas, Political, political and Cultural Resistance at the University of Minnesota, Afro-Latinos, Global Spaces, Local Struggles at UCLA, and Reconfigurations of Racism and New Scenarios of Power after 2001 at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, as well as the 2009 Conference on Indigenous and Afro-Descendant Issues at the University of Texas at Austin, and reflections of the reconfiguration of non-Latin American subjectivities within transnational frameworks. Afro-Latinidades are an example of a theme that must be framed beyond conventional parameters in a larger landscape of hemispheric and global geopolitics, cultural politics, and political economy. New areas of knowledge are continually being opened up by Latin Americanists, both those from Latin America and the US, as well as across the globe. Many scholars profit from the free interchange of scholarship across the world. In this light, the, re the emergence of world anthropologies and other analogous movements signal the transformation of disciplinary fields worldwide. The Latin American's challenge is to bring both the institutional disciplines and their contestation into congruence with, the, with this new diversity, geopolitical landscape, and transformations outline. What the Center in Latin American Studies entails. As an institutionalized knowledge formation, Latin American studies remain largely centered in the U.S. Historically, moreover, the field has been hegemonized by its fun founding U.S.-based disciplinary formations with early 20th century work concentrated in history and literature while political science rose to predominance after the 1960s. Disciplines shape, now no, disciplines shape how knowledge is produced and who is authorized to produce it. The predominance of US-based disciplinary formations within the field, therefore, meant that research and knowledge production were largely driven by US-centric assumptions and political imperatives. Even the left tended to be more concerned with US foreign policy in the region and its consequences that with interrogating the often anglo-centric epistemological foundations of the disciplines. If much research and knowledge production has been historically Eurocentric, hegemonized by mostly white northern scholars and dominated by a few disciplines, then the centering the field necessarily entails challenging its anglo-eurocentric assumptions, more fully incorporating scholars and subaltern knowledge producers from both the North and the South and expanding its transdisciplinary reach. The idea of the centering serves as an epistemic metaphor deployed to move thinking beyond Western and Eurocentric conceptual sessions and to seek new ways of framing the issues of political and cultural production of agency. What emerges is a new, pers what emerges is a new perspective on how Latin American studies not only has to be read historically and culturally, it also suggests how shifts of epistemic knowledge production from center to margins still have to be explored if we are to develop a more comprehensive understanding of how knowledge power operates with, between Anglo-Eurocentric assumptions and those deployed by Latin American subjects and others. The center in Latin American studies implies at least five interrelated institutional, methodological, and epistemological moves. First, it calls for greater inclusion of practitioners and perspectives on of Latin American studies outside the US, thereby furthering dialogue among diversely positioned intellectuals. Few scholars residing in Latin America would consider themselves Latin Americans. This poses a number of questions critical to decentering and transnationalization. What are the geopolitics of knowledge involved in the study of the Latino Americas as viewed from diverse positionalities in different locations? Is there another growing dialogue across national boundaries among Latin America-based scholars 
that might, might yield nuevos conocimientos, nuevas ideas y nuevas imágenes de América Latina? How might all of us individually and collectively work to forge more genuinely horizontal and thoroughly transnational forms of scholarly collaboration with our counterparts? As others made abundantly clear, Latin Americanism also takes on a wide range of meanings and forms as it moves across east-west as well as south-south and north-south axes. To fully engage these diverse Latin Americanisms, decentering the film requires, secondly, the pursuit of diversity well beyond neoliberal multiculturalism. It needs the promotion of diversity contientes, if you will, capable of unsettling and potentially transforming received scholarly practices and the knowledge those dominant practices have generated. The center requires attentiveness to who gets cited, who gets translated, what and who travels within Latin American studies. We have to problematize the use of English as the de facto dominant language question prevailing US-centric citational practices among Northern scholars, denounce the limited circulation of Latin America and other global South-based scholars and texts within institutionalized knowledge formations, and point to the unidirectionality of prevailing translation and publication practices and standards, all issues that are crucial to a more thorough decentering and internationalization of the field not to mention their centrality to combating the invisibility, marginality of subaltern perspectives in knowledge production. Questions of theoretical travels, textual translations, and multiple positionalities within contemporary Latin American studies are further complicated by the growing number, numbers of diasporic Latin American origin intellectuals who today work in the Metropolitan Academy as compared to our scarce numbers during the heyday of Cold War area studies. In that respect, the presence of the immigrant imaginary increasingly has complicated the practice of area studies in the US. The connection between the Latin American immigrant imaginary and that of multi-generation US Latinas, Latinos within institutionalized Latin American and Latino studies formulations mixing what is understood as here and there in the Latino Americas has spurred some of the most exciting cross-border interdisciplinary work in recent decades. This is a third vital force in the decentering and revitalization of Latin American studies. Transmigration and accelerated flows of peoples, ideas, and capital across the Americas has forced a reimagining of both Latin America and US Latinas and Latinos. Further, incorporating the voices and perspectives of Latinas and Latinos in the U.S. and of other historically marginalized groups in the Latina and Latino Americas is therefore vital to the centering Latin American studies. Given that the U.S. is already the fourth largest Spanish-speaking nation in the world, and in light of large and growing populations of Portuguese and Haitian Creole speakers and indigenous and Afro-descendant migrants from Latin America, a decentered Latino American studies would, uniquely, uh, would be uniquely posed to promote innovative, policy relevant knowledge about transmigrations and diasporas. Producing knowledge relevant to the meeting, to meeting the challenges facing the Latin Americas in the 21st century also requires furthering a genuinely interdisciplinary rather than simply multidisciplinary perspectives and cross-disciplinary collaboration, the fourth vital dimension of the Central in Latin American Studies. Yet, interdisciplinarity itself is in dire need of being revisioned and updated. Latin American Studies historically has been largely a multi rather than an interdisciplinary enterprise. Traditionally, it has aggregated disciplines but has not always actively fostered the creative convergence of discipline-based knowledges. Area studies centers and programs too often have resembled sandboxes, as Latin American historian Florencia Mayon put it, where colleagues in different disciplines like small children in a sandbox engage in parallel play, but do not actually engage with one another. 
Latin American studies entails not just interdisciplinary dialogue, but also conversations and collaboration with other inter-transdisciplinary fields, including family studies, critical race studies, LGBTH studies, cultural studies, social movement studies, postcolonial studies, and so on. Finally, unsettling historically hegemonic forms and practices requires that we promote productive dialogues between university-based and non-university-based alternative knowledge producers. We must be more attentive to the fact that knowledge about the Latino Americas is produced in an ever wider range of places and spaces within and without the academy, from professionalized non-governmental organizations and autonom autonomous feminist collectives to barrio organizations linked to the alternative globalization movement. For many dialogue across the borders that conventionally have separated academic and non-academic sides of theory production can only prove mutually enriching. Concerns and contradictions. In response to the five part transformation described here, three explicit sources of resistance have emerged. The takeover of unfamiliar and incomprehensible scholarly paradigms, such as cultural studies, the politicization of scholarly affairs, and serious erosion of our standards of scholarly rigor. Before examining them, a general comment about diversity is in order. The Latin American studies inherited from the founding generation, roughly speaking the years from 1950 to 1970, were a strikingly homogeneous affair. Women were just beginning to wedge the struggle for inclusion and recognition. Intellectuals from any of the racialized subaltern populations of the Americas were almost completely absent. The presence of Latin American born intellectuals in northern institutions was the rare and exceptional. White straight males from the North were the norm. And while they by no means all thought alike or defended the same paradigms, race and gender, to keep the list short, combined to yield dominant patterns of sociability and an, an, an implicit comfort zone which exerted a powerful influence on the intellectual constitution of the field. These excessive waves of diversification raised two distinct questions. Would the zone remain comfortable with these new members included? Would they bring radically different intellectual agendas to the fore? In general, the answer to the first question was a cautious yes, as long as the answer to the second was no. The three expressions of resistance within Latin American studies in the 21st century are ongoing reactions to the steady undoing of the comfort zone, which began some three decades ago. Within NASA and in Latin American centers across the U.S., the rise and alleged takeover of cultural studies has become a metaphor for the critic's summary of what is wrong about the transformation described here. It also signaled a resistance of some actors of the social sciences to reincorporate humanity scholars as equal partners after their surge in, their po in the post-war period that led some scholarly sectors to label the humanities as obsolete. What well, this attitude might have responded in part to the transformation of the social sciences within the U.S., it did not correspond to Latin America, a continent that experienced its richest literary and cultural productivity in the second half of the 20th century. Many of the political events and hidden agendas taking place in the hemisphere during the, that period seem to be most aptly framed by literary language in part because the social sciences were dominated by European and American methodological approaches that could not account for the social events unleashed in Latin America during the 1960s uh, until dependency theory, internal colonialism, and theology of liberation, as well as the pedagogy of the oppressed, and an emerging reflection on popular cultures and on the legacy of Western thinking in an heterogeneous and contradictory continent emerged from within. All these lines of thought were combined with the innovative production of literary and popular culture in the 1960s, including boom literature, street theater, the new cinema, and the Nueva Canción movement in popular music to deliver a new understanding of both symbolic production and social imaginaries on the continent, thus systematizing an original way of understanding cultural reality that would continue into the 1990s. 
Criticism on the, criticisms on the cultural studies takeover in more recent times have focused on the language of scholarly discourse, the expanded objects of study, and most important, the explicit renunciation of disciplinary norms, boundaries, and loyalties in favor of transdisciplinary inquiry. While all three of these alleged ills are potential problems, the idea that they accurately encapsulate cultural studies or post-structural and post-colonial approaches as a whole is preposterous. They should be read primarily as visceral reaction to the rupture of an ostensibly intact intellectual consensus. If this rupture of the comfort zone were acknowledged and accepted rather than resisted, sharp intellectual disagreement and recipro reciprocal critique would remain. It would be, however, a source of enrichment rather than threat, bringing different theoretical tra traditions, academic codes, topics of study, and methodological commitments into dialogue with one another, expanding the scope of scholarly inquiry for all involved. Concerns about polarization are more complex because they have two distinct points of reference. One inside academia, and one in the relations between academia and broader social relations part of the world. The only reasonable response to, the, to this first realm of politics is to affirm intellectual pluralism such that the defense of a value-free political practice of social inquiry becomes one variation among a range of epistemological groundings. The second one implies a commitment to actively fashioning our scholarship to advance a specific political good of human rights, gender equality, anti-racist struggle, and so forth. This is more complicated because there is no guarantee that the actions involved will all be consistent with the values and priorities of the academic community in question. While acknowledging the absence of such guarantees, scholars still need to make these connections and to announce them explicitly for two reasons. They highlight a vital engagement with the world which always has been a greater strength of Latin American studies. And making these connections explicit opens greater possibilities for productive and clarifying debate. We should not forget that many diasporic scholars, originally from Latin America and now working in the US, have been trained in their countries of origin to draw political consequences from their research, and that in some instances, these become public policy. It has been the national order of things in 20th century Latin America, more influenced by French scholarship's engaged attitude than by apolitical Anglo-Saxon traditions. Finally, critics argue that academic standards have suffered considerably in the wake of the transformations chronicled here. The only constructive way to confront this dilemma is to encourage both the dissidents and rigorous, rigorous deliberation on renewed standards of scholarly merit to follow. The former can be justified on strictly scholarly grounds, quite apart from ethical political considerations. The latter, deliberation on renewed standards of scholarly merit, is an essential component of any paradigm shift, only more productive if it is carried out in a transparent and self-reflexive manner. My main objective is to present a coherent persuasive, persuasive case for this emergent vision to document its contents and to help it achieve proportionate space and recognition within the profession. Latin American people should not be seen as objects of study by scholars in imperial nations, but as equal partners in knowledge production accomplished through exchange and interaction. Thank you very much.